Well, so we've really, I mean, we kind of seem to be in this global season of deconstruction to a degree, mm-hmm. right? Everybody's kind of reconceptualizing, mm-hmm. arguing, what is this? What is that? And I think we have an inherited cultural Christianity that we haven't really held up to the lens of scripture. Mm-hmm. So my question is, mm-hmm. what actually is the church? Because mm-hmm. we attend church, you know, we we say that we are the church, we communicate this one message on a Sunday, then when COVID hits, we're not communicating that we are the church anymore, the church is where we gather and let us back in our buildings. I know, hot button topic, but we'll get back to it. <laughs> so the real question is, what actually is the church? How do we engage and how do we belong? Yeah. That's good. That's my mm-hmm. thought. Mm-hmm. It's a conversation I feel like we've been having here mm. around stream since 2019. I know we've had them prior to that with other people, but it's been a topic of conversation. We actually had a meeting in our home before the church started, and that was what we started with was yeah. what is the church, you know? Um, I think it's important to have sort of a defined, not sort of, it's important to kind of have a defined thing A defined definition, that's a circular definition that I just did, but I mean, you get it. But a definition, because otherwise we are led astray. So things like COVID or things like this whole deconstruction, Mm -hmm. like right now, the hottest topic is what is a woman? Mm -hmm. And if we don't have clear scriptural context Mm -hmm. for what is a woman, it can be very easy to be swayed, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same for the church. If I don't have a clear picture from scripture of what the church is and what it is not, mm-hmm. then it's yeah. easy to be swayed. Yeah. I mean, I could start with what it's not. Yeah. I was, uh, I met a guy that had been at the time I met him, he'd been a missionary in Africa for 25 years. He finished a 30 year commitment a couple of years ago. So I met him a while back and I was visiting with him. I actually went to the trans guy in South Africa and to minister with him. He was talking about how, you know, he, he'd personally baptized 10,000 people. Um, he was the only Western missionary to the, the whole tribe, the Osa people, which is always fun to say it with a click. Um, and he had planted, you know, thousands of churches. I'm like, well, how many churches have you actually planted? He goes, well, it depends on how you define a church. And it started this conversation because, the, you know, it is a church where people gather because they go to a village. And they preach the gospel, but there's no pastor, there's no leader, and it might be six months, three months before anybody comes back to do any discipleship, but then a bunch of people have found the Lord, and so now they're meeting together, and they tell them how important it is to get together and to talk about what God's doing in their lives and to worship and sing some of the songs that they learned, and you know, not many of them would even have a Bible, like that. that's just, but they were just gathering for mutual encouragement and to talk about what was going to pray for one another and worship. Because you can give that in, you know, a few hours, a weekend, and then you can leave and there's something there, you know, talking about some concepts. Or is church when you have a leader that comes in that's able to, to pastor or is church when you have a building? Because if it's when you have a building, he says, "Ah, I'm probably planted four or five. But there are, you know, there were hundreds that he'd started a Bible school. So he had pastors for these churches because he kept on going into villages, people would get saved. And I mean, it's a day's walk to get to any other village. It's not like they're going to go and gather Mm. in, in a centralized place to have church. So, well, what is church? Now, if you go to, I've got a friend of mine that's a, a bishop in the Anglican church. There, there's something about being a part of the apostolic succession that, that, that is key. There's something about the partaking of communion. Um, as a gathered people, there's the reading of the word. Um, and there's prayers. So, and teaching is, is there, mm-hmm. but it, it's not essential in every gathering for it to be a church gathering, um, which would also be very similar to, to the Catholic understanding um, in current firms. Mm-hmm. Then I just did this whole study on church history. You go back 400 years ago, 500 years ago, the church we call Christendom. Um, it, it's this idea that the church is the government of God. 
and is integrated with rulership in human empires. And so, you know, if you're in France and you are a priest or you're a pastor, um, you are part of the governmental structure and you give authority to whoever your city officials are, your kings, your nobles, to be able to be kings, to be able to be nobles, and you're putting God's authority on it. And what it means to be the church is to be the community that is the kingdom of God in that understanding, which is the governmental structure of representing Christ in the world. Now, I mean, we're 400 years from that. I even say that, and most people are like, that's weird. Who would ever think that? But that is most of the church age from about 360 all the way until well after, about 70 years after the uh, um, the Reformation, almost into the 1600s. I mean, it took a couple hundred years for that to, to actually happen. But the Church of England is an example of where it hasn't actually happened yet. Like there's still an integration with right. royalty and the royal the, the queen, now King, King Charles, just got coronated. As of the recording of this, it was just last week, but I know that this will be re, you know released later. But he, he's now the head of the church of England. He is the head. Mm -hmm. Now there's limits and there's all that understanding. There's a lot to it. It's mm -hmm. a lot more nuanced than that. But that, there's a lot of pictures of what the church is not that when we think about what we're, our conversation, what is the church, it's got to be in the context of what has been the church. And, you know, a friend of mine, he said, if it doesn't preach anywhere, everywhere, it shouldn't preach anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whatever. So if we come up with a definition of church, okay, that's great for here in America, but does that work in the villages in Africa? Mm -hmm. Does that work in communist China? Does that work in North Korea? And does it work in South America? And does it work in yeah. post-Christian Europe? Mm -hmm. Like, it's got to work everywhere if it's real. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's got to be more of the conversation. Yeah, that's really good. I'm actually very curious, even with Sarah being young, and I feel like the question right now mm -hmm. in the youth is, what is the church? What's the oh. purpose of the church? Mm -hmm. And really, why should I even care or go? How would you answer I think the first step, really, in my mind, is let's go back to the foundations of what the scripture says. Um, in Matthew, we see when Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, you are the rock upon which I'll build my church, that word church is actually ecclesia, which means set apart or anointed ones. And I think we have a tendency to overcomplicate what it means to be church. Mm -hmm. But from the earliest definitions, it was just the anointed people of Christ gathering together and how they were then set apart on mission from those around them. And so I think when we get into too much of the um, micro pieces of what church is, it causes young people to just tune out because they don't want to hear about the disciplines and the rituals and all of that because they've been burned by those things. They want to know, can I be a part of church? in a different way. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that there is something really beautiful about tradition. And I think there's something really beautiful about keeping specific disciplines alive. And I think there's a necessity for that. But on the flip side, it's also important to water it down in this way to the most simple form of church is the people of God gathered to celebrate and encourage their faith in one another and their faith in the Lord. And well, faith, you know what I mean? the faith in the Lord within one another. Let me clarify my words there. Um, and so I guess my response to young people would be to remember what the church came from and not what people made it. Yeah. yeah. And um, church history is a beautiful tool. I have loved studying it. I've loved seeing the highs and lows and how we've gotten it right and how we've gotten it wrong. And in all of that, I think it's just important to remember that the original purpose of the church was a place for believers to gather to use their giftings, to bring their strengths and their weaknesses, and to together glorify the Father. Mm -hmm. For that place to be one of just um, mutual encouragement and spiritual safety, a place to offer everything that we had before the Lord and to do that in community. And so I think for young people, it's just important for them to remember that you don't have to have a specific box of what church looks like to you, but you do need to be involved 
in a church community. We've lost the importance of spiritual accountability. We've lost the importance of community, especially after COVID. Mm-hmm. I've never been more devastated than, um, and I use this example because I just graduated. My class started, it was one of the biggest classes my university had had in years. And there were two rows of undergraduates that graduated at my ceremony. Wow. Because everyone dropped over COVID. Wow. They either dropped out of school, they went fully online and didn't want to attend the ceremony. And I was just heartbroken watching mm-hmm. this reality. And I feel like it's a really clear picture of the church is that people now think, oh, well, I don't have to be a part of this anymore. I don't have to put my mm-hmm. roots in, have this community, be personally involved. So I'm not going to. Yes, your relationship with the Lord is personal. Yes, you can have just that, but you also have to have what Romans 12 talks about, which is that every piece of the body of Christ is essential and has to be combined in order to make the full bride that Jesus is marrying. I am rambling now, but man, it's (laughs) just, there's so much theology on this that my brain just keeps Mm. going, but yes, yes. But it goes back further too. Because I want to just jump on something out in yeah. Hebrews. It actually says it refers to Israel as the congregation in the wilderness. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So point. you got to take it back further. It's so yeah. good. Right? Because the thing that qualified them as the congregation in the wilderness was not them, but the fact that the presence of God was in the middle Amen. of them. Amen. Yeah. yeah. That's and, such a good point. But in that, in the law, right? a whole way of life was given to the congregation that wasn't just pertained to worship, but that mm. all of life with God was worship unto God. Yeah. Yes. So I think we've separated out the gathering together for the edification and the building up, and we've removed the reality of life together mm. yeah. is just as much holy unto the Lord as when we gather corporately. Yes. And I think that, whole dynamic of what is the church we have 12 different tribes different functions Mm -hmm. i mean i don't think it's an accident that first corinthians 12 romans 12 it all talks about body parts interconnectedness Mm -hmm. the lord's so clever Mm -hmm. the way he knits this together it's Mm -hmm. look life with god is being the church and israel was not just called the congregation of the lord they were rebuked for being an unfaithful bride yeah. yeah. So we're supposed to be, a, a, in in my understanding, a people who are gathered together that do life as unto the Lord and represent the bridal affection of God being expressed in the earth. Yeah. Well, in the piece you, you mentioned, the presence of God in the midst. 100%. Because when you mention Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, mm-hmm. and you can add Ephesians 4, three different places where there's listings of giftings, and there are also the three different places where it talks about the body, the church being the body, mm. yeah. different parts. So the key is, I mean, I always talk about it from the side of spiritual gifting, like we're all, you know, this is what makes us the body. But the body being together is together because God is in the midst. And if God is not in the midst, it's not the church. Right. Amen. And that is, mm-hmm. that's really important. It, it's not, a, it's not a social club. Right. Mm-hmm. It's gathering around him yeah. and his life mm-hmm. in us so that good. lets us be the church. It's why it's important to differentiate between small group and home church even. And I'm not mm-hmm. trying to give labels, but mm-hmm. you know, we can, we can have groups where we go and we shoot guns together. And I'm thinking of the guys group clearly um, <laughs> and have dinner and never talk about the Lord, but we carry, you know, who we are in Christ and all of that with us. But that is not church. Yeah. That is being social and that's loving one another and building community and trust and all of those things so that it births, it, it transfers over. But one thing that I really want to point out that I feel like there's really something on with this is that the world is a mirror of the church. And so when we are, when we are walking out in what we've been called to do, then the world is actually a different place. And I know, I mean, we can get into the whole theology of who, who is the ruler of the world and blah, blah, blah. But truly we set the tone for so much. So now you take your example of the, you know, um, dissemination really of the people. And you look at that in the world and it is the exact same problem. So people are struggling with their identity. I mean, I literally saw a video the other day where these people were practicing how to operate as wolves. They had these kids down on the ground. Like, I 
I was like, is this a joke? Is this video a meme? And it was not. Mm. It was not a joke because they don't know who they are. We don't know who we are apart from the church. It takes the community of believers with the presence of God. Mm. Yeah. And it takes that the, the loving correction mm. that comes mm. um, being in community. I mean, you think about, you know, you just take one example. You know, Moses is up having this crazy, amazing encounter and he comes down to this golden calf, you know, mm. and you, you know, you have the conversations in your mind, like, how did we get there when you can see this? <laughs> and again, that could be a video for a whole other day, mm. except to say there had to be this correction of that. You know, we need this course mm. correction that comes with it. And I'm not even necessarily talking about church discipline. I'm talking about community and mm. I'm talking about mm. fellowship and I'm talking about, Hey, remember, remember who you are, remember who you are mm. in Christ Jesus. And to me, it's not just who is the church? It's the function of the church mm -hmm. that we're missing. It's that call to holiness. It is those spiritual disciplines. Yeah. It is all of those things that, you know, as much as we don't want like necessarily tradition sometimes, you know, there is also a huge draw to it for a lot mm -hmm. of young people. Why? Right. Because yeah. they are like, I am so confused. Mm -hmm. I am so desperately looking for stability and safety yeah. and, you know, a place where I understand what's going on. Yeah. Can you offer that? And we're over here in the church, not sure who we are. Yeah, It's such a disservice to the it world. Is. If we're going to be the reflection yeah. of Christ, if we're going to love God and love others, we have to get this part really right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Heart. No, it's good. Yeah. It's really good. I mean, Ephesians 2.22 is a verse that I have sat with for a while. God is building us together to be, and it says a dwelling place, but it's actually a resting place. Mm -hmm for himself in the spirit. Mm. So there's something about the intention of God for his people, not just to be the gathered out, the anointed, the sent out, but actually the place where he comes to rest. Because yeah. rest was created for God and man got invited into that. The historians, theologians will tell you that when the gods create anything, it was primarily for themselves. So when God created rest, we were beneficiaries, but he was actually building a resting place in Eden for himself to dwell with us. Yeah. And so there's something about getting back to that DNA yeah. Yeah. of what God is doing. And I don't think we're necessarily there. I think we see snippets of that because we love, we love making statements mm. and sexy one-liners. You know, we don't want a culture of visitation. We want a culture of habitation. Well, in order for us to actually be mm. the resting place of God, the priesthood of God, of all believers, has mm. to come back to the forefront. Yeah, An yes. altar of affection to his yes. heart has to be in the middle. Amen. Yeah. Because it says that he establishes his throne on the praises of his people, and those praises are affection mm -hmm. for who he is, what he's done, and what mm. he continues to do. That's how he enthrones and rests yeah. on his people. And I think structures are not in and of themselves incorrect, but I think what defines the church is who's actually in the middle of the structure. Is there a pulpit with a preacher or is there an altar of affection directed towards Jesus? Yeah. Amen. I think that has to be one of the key signifiers as we're hoping to reframe. I would actually say restore. Mm. It's not really we're reframing right. anything. Yeah. We're yeah. reorientating really yeah. back to yeah. what we're always supposed to be. Mm. Yeah. But it's primarily affection for God and a place where his spirit rests, yeah. has communion, fellowship with us, like that reality that God desires to rest among his people yeah. gets lost yeah. because we're trying to do things towards God instead of actually having God. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near unto you. Yeah. Yeah. But he's not going to draw towards a pulpit, but he will yeah. an altar. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm wrestling with right now? This is just a transparent moment. I had this thought yesterday. I was really praying through a situation and being a truth teller and being a peacemaker and not a peacekeeper and all of that. And I'm like, you know, where I fall short in that stuff is that I'm serving the institution mm. rather than God, because mm. I'm worried about what it'll do to the institution. I'm worried about what it'll do to the, you know, whatever. And when I have that thought, it was so convicting. I actually cried like, for real tears yesterday and I might do it right now. It's incredibly convicting because it's so easy to make the church 
about reputation, mm. about when we're just, I said yesterday to a group of people when I was just really challenging us is that it's, it can make us liars, mm. this desire mm. to serve something yep. rather than one another mm. through the context of mm. loving one another well, because we are being, you know, we have here at Streams, we have these values on the wall and I'm like, they have to be real. Like I have to stand in this place for this to be real or mm. I just need to go. Like that's a lie. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, mm. And that is my big, and I think that's what truly, if you looked at what the heart of what people are wrestling with, it's that kind of stuff of yeah. when did the institution and the reputation become so important that we're willing to be liars and we're willing to let things just be not okay. And yeah relationally not okay and all of that to kind of keep a facade you know but we're we're protecting the reputation of the institution whilst not protecting his reputation yeah exactly so there is a reputation to protect yeah 100 percent. and that's the conviction that those were the tears yesterday it's michael cullianos that said if you have to hurt you have to if you have to choose who you're going to hurt don't hurt jesus yeah yeah Yeah. and i think that's part of the conversation in you know, we're protecting structures and right. sometimes we're protecting each other from what we think is a good motive. Right. But really, like you said, we're dishonest. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. we're doing things because it's what's expected right. of each other, mm-hmm. not what's expected of him. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we even say stuff like God's, God's a big boy. He can protect himself, but we're commanded to not yeah. take his name in vain, meaning yeah. don't misrepresent who he is. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. There's this uh, the concept of a name, mm-hmm. like the biblical concept of a name, is a name is a definition of identity. So when Adam gave names to all the animals, he was saying what they were. Mm-hmm. He, he wasn't just giving a label that was a cute slogan, mm-hmm. right? He was identifying. He was naming them. Take that forward into, I'm going to forget where it is, in the New Testament, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Ephesians, that he's the one from whom every family on earth and heaven gets their name, mm. their identity. When we lose, the church is the family of God, the body of Christ. Like we have these, the temple of the Lord. We have these three main pictures in that we have. The whole thing is coming back to this. It's about him. Mm-hmm. It's, it's about him. He is the identity. He, he's the thing that holds it together. So if church becomes anything other than him, altar of affection, mm-hmm. if, if the corporate identity, if the picture of it, if, if it's anything other than his dwelling place, where, where his identity, where he is the name, of everything. We've missed the church. But then that, that also, that, that helps us a whole bunch because you know, there's an allergy. Like the reason that there's so much division in the church is because there's denominations. You know, I've heard that, you know, somebody just recently told me, you know, all the denominations in the church, it's just a, it, you know, it's a problem. Denominations were actually created to be a solution. So that we could still consider ourselves part of the church and have differences of opinion and not have to separate and splinter. That was the origin when, when they called them denominations, because you look at what denomination means. Mm-hmm. It, it's not a separate piece. It's not a new church. It's just another part of this whole mm-hmm. that, that we can identify as the church and still hold on to our pieces and our emphasis and, and our convictions. But our identity is first and foremost with the church of God. Yeah. And, and that recognition that that, that's what separates the church from the country club, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from the Elks club, yeah. you know, from the Masons. Like we, you know, the, we are gathered around Jesus yeah. and our identity, our unity is because we're his, because he is the father. He is giving us his name. And the family that we've been given, the name he's given to this family is Christ in Christian. Little Christs. 
And that that's the origin of Christian. You know, I'm a believer. I'm not really a Christian. Well, you know, that's not an option. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Christ in and Christ in the center. Mm-hmm. And that can look all kinds of different ways. Yeah. That can look like a, a little group in Africa that's gathering together because they realize that Jesus saves and that there's hope in the midst of their pain. It can be the the cathedral in the midst of, of Europe that has been there for 1,500 years and is the place where the kings go to receive their crowns and to be validated. And it can be the group uh, of, of hungry believers that gathered in a living room here somewhere in America because they found out that the Holy Spirit's real and they just wanted to get together and pray for one another and love on one another. And it can be the group hiding out in, in a little apartment in China that's trying to figure out how to live out this life and maintain their faith in the midst of a culture that tells them that they can't have anything or do anything unless they line up with everybody else. All of the above. Yeah. It's the identity of Jesus. Mm. Yeah. And that, that gets rid of the walls. Mm-hmm. The walls. I mean, who, who cares if we put the label Lutheran or Methodist or Baptist or Catholic or Orthodox or Assembly of God or Vineyard or brethren, or Mennonite, or or any other like that. None of that stuff really matters if we're the church. And if we're not the church, then all of that stuff, it matters a whole bunch in all the wrong ways. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's good. Mm. Did we solve all the world's <laughs> No, I think we just opened a whole other can of <laughs> <laughs> We need so many more parts, as usual.